So Africh, uh, can we start? Yeah, sure. Hi, good evening. Uh, welcome to our monthly webinar. This is the third week for Rumato Month, and uh, we have uh, our topic will be a uh, approach to SLE treatment. Very important topic, and we have uh, two experts uh, on this field. And I welcome our chairperson for today is uh, Dr. Moliza, our head of department of Selayang Hospital, plus uh, head of service rheumatological service in KKM. I'm very privileged to welcome her for today's section. Thank you. Assalamualaikum and good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Given uh, and Academy of Medicine uh, for hosting this rheumatology month. Uh, first, I have to uh, correct Dr. Given. I am not the head of department of uh, medical department Sayang. Dr. Okay. Habibah, the head of department. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so uh, today is uh, SLE and we have uh, uh, Dr. Doraini, uh, who is the consultant and rheumatologist in Hospital uh, Raja Perempuan Bainon, Ipoh. And SLE is her pet subject and she has much interest in it. And she's also active in our registry as well as our um, publications and um, anything to do with rheumatology uh, diseases. So without further ado, I think uh, uh, I'll pass the floor to Dr. Noraini to deliver her lecture. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Moliza, for the kind introduction. And also thank you for, uh, to College of Physicians of Malaysia for inviting me to be the guest speaker. Uh, I'm really not the expert, but I will try to, to uh, give... Uh, a rough idea uh, on, on what SLE is all about. It's not an easy subject and it's not easy to treat also. Uh, we can have um, patients who might come with a simple, um, straightforward um, uh, SLE, but at times we do have uh, many patients who do not actually uh, conform to the, to the normal way of presentation. Okay, so next slide, please. So um, my outline, I will give you three uh, different cases for you to just keep in mind. We will go back to all the three cases. Um, before, uh, before we go to all the cases, um, I will give you some outline on the overview of pathophysiology of SLE and treatment options. And if we have enough time, we will talk about uh, SLE and pregnancy. So case one, uh, we have a 26-year-old Malay woman, single, presented with three-month history of intermittent fever, loss of appetite and weight. She also has joint pain, mainly affecting her PIPJs and MCPJs. Chest X-ray clear, black cultures negative. This is the ESR, uh, 90, CRP less than 5, urine FEM in normal. So this is the first case. Second case. We have a 23-year-old Malay woman presented to local clinic with increasing dyspnea, intermittent fever but no loss of appetite or weight, chest x-ray right pleural effusion, initially treated as a CAP with paranormonic effusion. Three weeks later, repeated chest x-ray showed the same effusion and, and she was referred to the chest clinic uh, from the local clinic. Next. She was then electively admitted to the ward for further workup noted unilateral loss of eyebrow, exudative pleural effusion, TB screening negative, and the rest of the test, basic tests were all normal. The third case, 52-year-old Chinese woman, ITP for past 70 years, presented with progressive dyspnea, worsening to the point that she couldn't lie flat. Her echo showed pericardial effusion. She also had bilateral pleural effusion, Urine FEME 3 plus protein, 24-hour urinary protein was 1.5 gram. This was her renal function, okay, and echo showed poor LV function. So just uh, try to remember all these three cases presented in a different way. Um, two young women and one else slightly elderly uh, woman. So, and then we can go back to this after we go through some of the uh, introduction on SLE. So overview of SLE is an autoimmune multisystem disorder, um, failure of self-recognition, an unknown etiology until now, 
is incurable disease, uh, female preponderance, nine to one, uh, roughly, uh, more common, uh, more prevalent among Asians uh, before Afro-Caribbean and uh, lesser in Caucasian. In Malaysia, um, similar uh, percentage between Chinese and Malays and less in Indian. Uh, peak incidence of, uh, uh, of the SLE is roughly about 20 to 40 age group. And disease manifestation can be mild, moderate to severe. So we look at the etiology. As I said before, there is no one single cause, cause uh, uh, for the uh, etiology of the SLE. Okay? It's a multifactorial overlapping of a few things. Okay? One of them is genetic factor. And then you have immunologic factors, hormonal factors, and environment, environmental factors. And we can speed up the slide on this. So this is just to show the interplay between the genetic factors, immunology, hormonal, and environmental that led to abnormal uh, of the immune response. And this led to SLE. So why SLE is so difficult? Because it's so heterogeneous, okay? It can affect any part of the body from brain, basically from top to bottom, um, the, the pink color is the life-threatening organ uh, involvement, such as brain, if you have vasculitis okay, in, the, in the brain, if you have um, palmy hemorrhage in the, of the lung, um, kidney, okay, uh, lupus nephritis, or if you have conditions like, uh, serious conditions like TTP, okay, these are all organ-threatening uh, involvement of the SLE. Less threatening, which is quite common, is uh, skin. Uh, they can present to you with rash, you know, either acute skin lesion or chronic. You can, they can also have arthralgia okay, or arthritis. Um, and sometimes they can present with uh, breathlessness and, um, and there is pleural effusion and pericardial effusion. So you can see that it can affect any part of the body and hence sometimes SLE can, you know, can, uh, may not be detected uh, very easily, especially in acute psychotic patient who does not have any other symptoms apart from being psychotic. Next slide. So not all lupus is the same. So that's why I always tell my patient, if you speak to another, you can have, you can join the, the, the lupus group it's uh, a support group uh, just to understand, just to get some support from each other, but must not must always remember that one lupus, her lupus will probably be a bit different from the other person. Okay, so it can be mild, such as rash, oral ulcers, arthritis, confined to skin and joints, and they can just have fever and fatigue. Severe is when you have diffuse or ulcerating rashes, significant kidney disease, brain disease, or very low platelet. Uh, or bad hemolysis, okay, or in a condition such as TTP, or they can have palmy hemorrhage bleeding into the lung. And the picture can change. Nobody can predict how uh, one SLE can actually uh, go through the years, okay? Some will have one uh, attack and they are in remission throughout their life. Some will have remitting and relapsing, okay? So, no, and nobody can predict that. And hence, the reason why all these patients need to come and see the doctor on a regular basis with certain blood tests and monitoring. So, these are the old criteria that we, we tend to use, okay? And um, you can go through later uh, yourself. You can always download it or actually review in the, in the internet. Uh, next slide. So American College of Rheumatology has also revised this criteria and, um, and this was then looked, uh, they looked into it to actually try and catch the patient earlier, okay, so that we don't miss the, the lupus patient. This is just to introduce what is SLEEK is all about, okay. Next. And uh, Michelle Petrie, she's the guru uh, for SLE. Okay, and 
This is her statement. If you use the classification criteria to diagnose SLE, I promise not to tell anyone. Okay, you must remember classification criteria is a is not a diagnostic criteria. Classification criteria is, is uh, we, we come up with classification criteria so that patients can be enrolled into uh, research in a uh, systematic way rather than you know, in a haphazard way. However, with a slick criteria, you can somehow uh, pick up the patient and diagnose the patient easier, okay? So this, uh, this is what sleep criteria, it divides into two. You have clinical and immunology, okay? So I wouldn't go into detail on this, but you can see um, they, they divided, okay? Uh, the hematological manifestation into three areas. You can have hemolytic anemia, leukopenia, lymphopenia, and thrombocytopenia, whereby all these were lumped into one. So even the skin manifestation also, he actually divided into acute cutaneous lupus and chronic uh, cutaneous lupus, whereby it was actually all in one lump uh, clinical manifestation. So immunology, um, you have uh, these immunology here. Okay, I, I, I'm not in control of the cursor. Okay, so um, you need to have one from each from both arms, uh, you need to have four and you have to have one from each. So you can't have all clinical without any immunology and you can't have all immunology without any clinical. So you must bear, uh, you must understand that. So this is just to emphasize. However, you, if you have a, a biopsy proven lupus nephritis with a positive ANA or double-stranded DNA, is, 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 is good enough to make a diagnosis of um, uh, SLE. So however, ACR and EULA have, re have looked into this, which, um, you know, um, they look into uh, the criteria in detail and then they try to see whether they can make it better. I wouldn't go into detail into this, but you just have to be aware there's a latest guideline, but the entry point for this the patient must be ANA positive. Okay, so um, again, it divided into a few areas and every area, every subtopics will have certain points. And if add up for more than 10, then you can classify the patient as, as SLE. Just rough, uh, this can go on uh, faster. So just to say the epidemiology, epidemiology a bit of epidemiology of uh, SLE in Malaysia and Asia Pacific, as I said before, Chinese and Malays are more or less similar, Indian only 7%, uh, mean age of onset about 25 years or 25, 26, okay? And we tend to be uh, more severe, okay? And more renal involvement. So about 65% about at initial diagnosis, you see that they have got renal involvement and some of them will also have NPSLE upon diagnosis. Long-term survival in general lower than in those in America and Europe is not because that we are not doing so well in terms of managing SLE, it's because of the severity. Remember just now I said that Caucasian is lesser, the, the, the number of patients are lesser in, 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 amongst the Caucasian, hence you have to understand that. So we are actually very good at managing SLE now, um, of course, many, many years ago when we don't have, when we don't have enough, uh, all, you know, the evidences and the knowledge and the, um, on, in terms of drugs availability, we only have steroid, but steroid tremendously improves the outcome of patients. So we, we were not doing so well then, but now I think we are at par amongst the Asian countries and also uh, the Caucasian countries. Most of the time, the cause of death is active disease and also secondly, infection and also cardiovascular, especially if they survive for more than 10 years, they will have some form of cardiovascular, I mean, accelerated atherosclerosis, especially if they have associated lupus nephritis. Okay, survival about a year, about 93%, and 10 years now is about 70%. We do not have a latest uh, epidemiology study. This is a few years back. So hopefully we can do one and then look at how we do so far in Malaysia. So these are the common triad of presentation amongst the patient of SLE. They present with fever, joint pain, and rash. So in a young patient, if they present in this manner, you have to think about SLE. 
So these are just a, a, a brief photo of how they can present non-erosive arthritis. Okay, again, uh, fast forward. Microcutaneous, okay, malar rash. Again, this is butterfly rash. See that, okay. And always, I always remember, okay, my, my bosses will always say, look at the, behind the ear for the discoid rash, okay. Sometimes you might miss it. So laboratory, these are the common tests that we do, ANA. Almost more than 98% will be uh, ANA positive. You will have anti double stranded DNA, especially in active lupus nephritis and hematological, helucopenia, thrombocytopenia, or hemolytic anemia. So these are the, the common things that you will see, a common abnormality that you will see in the blood results. So again, until April 2011, for more than 50 years, a new drug, that, that, since a new drug was approved for lupus. So you can see um, for many, many years, we don't have any, we don't have that many drugs approved for lupus. And finally, in March 2011, FDA approved the use of belumumab. But I wouldn't go into this because it's, 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 it's quite complicated. So the reason why it's so difficult to study, because as I said, as I tried to illustrate earlier, clinical expression is heterogeneous, pathology is diverse, disease activity is intermittent, lack of agreed upon disease activity measures and endpoints. Okay, sometimes uh, the number of patients that we accrued also probably very small number. And of course, with all the studies, it will acquire a lot of money. So treatment paradigm, uh, we would like to uh, improve the clinical cause of the disease by keeping the patient in remission if possible, if not low disease and preventing flares. That's the most important thing, okay? And we would like to lessen the long-term damage, especially accrual of irreversible, irreversible damage. So every time they flare, they will accrue some damage to their, to their body. And uh, of course, with a high dose of steroid, that can also uh, cause a lot of problem to them, okay? Not only uh, bone health and, and, and... Can we just go back a bit? Okay, so we would like... Our aim is basically to have uh, to, to, to control the disease in such a way where the patient can lead a normal life, okay? And if we can, we would like to treat to target. So treatment armamentarium, uh, these are the mainstay, okay? Firstly, hydroxychloroquine is a must for all patients uh, with SLE unless there, there, there is contraindication or they develop some adverse reaction, vitamin D, corticosteroid, um, we have to, we should be minimizing the dose if possible. Uh, and other immunosuppressive agents such as methotrexate, AZA, MMF, cyclophosphamide would be used according to the, um, according to the organs involvement and also as a steroid sparing agent. Okay, if we would, we would like the steroid to be uh, lowered to the dose minimum possible, less than 7.5 a day. If, if possible. And of course, there are there is also targeted biologic therapies such as belimumab and rituximab. This depends on the situation. Next. Again, this is just to highlight uh, every patient with lupus should be on vitamin uh, D and hydroxychloroquine, okay? Um, it's a must, okay? Um, it, 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 because hydroxychloroquine has been proven to, to, to improve outcome of patient uh, with SLE, especially in lupus nephritis, it enhances the effect of the microphenolate in some of the studies, okay? So, and it lessens the number of flares. Next slide. Okay, this is just uh, the same, repeating the same thing. Next slide. Here, other uh, uh, effect or uh, um, favorable effect of hydroxychloroquine it, uh, it uh, prevents thrombotic events, okay? This is from ongoing randomized multicenter trial, okay? It, as I said earlier, it prevents lupus flare, okay? It also works as uh, antiplatelet agent, inhibiting certain pathway in the glycoprotein 2B3A, okay? It lowers glycemia and lipids and downregulate inflammation. Now, hence, everybody should know by now that hydro hydroxychloroquine should be the mainstay of treatment. In the past, people thought that hydroxychloroquine uh, should only be given for those with some skin 
uh, involvement, but it's not. Okay, even though they they are in remission, they should be on hydroxychloroquine lifelong with monitoring. Next slide. Okay, the 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 weight will be uh, the the dose of the uh, the treatment dose will be based on weight, which is less than five milligram per kilogram. If the dose, if the if the disease has been fairly stable, say for more six months or so, then you can go down to two hundred milligram daily. Uh, hence, you uh, at the same time you have to make sure you um, send them for monitoring. Just mainly to look at the macula. Okay. Though glucocorticoid is a very, very important drug, okay, in managing lupus. Um, and we can't run away from using prednisolone, okay, especially when there is acute flare. However, we have to know from the studies that they have tried to see whether by putting patients on statin or including people, uh, patients on uh, other treatment, that there's not much of evidence except for um, Pregnisolone dose. So pregnisolone dose of beyond 6 mg a day technically increases the risk of cardiovascular in SLE patient. So if possible, when we manage um, lupus patient, we would like the, the dose of the pregnisolone to be kept as the, the lowest possible by using other drugs, okay? Uh, other drug as a sparing, a steroid sparing agent. Next. So when do we need to add more than pregnisolone and hydroxychloroquine? So there would be time when if a patient with SLE present acutely unwell. So those would be the time when we might have to use other uh, modalities in, the, in our treatment. Okay? So uh, acute emergencies in patients with systemic lupus, okay, such as neurologic involvement, systemic vasculitis, if they have profound thrombocytopenia with TTP, light syndrome, rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, or if they have uh, pom uh, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. Next. So these are the options of uh, options uh, of medications available to us. Okay, cyclophosphamide uh, readily available and cheaper to the rest, um, such as um, rituximab or valimumab. So even mycophenolate also it's not very easy. Is readily available for those uh, um, uh, renal patients. Okay. Uh, readily for to be used by the nephrologist but quite difficult for uh, rheumatologists to use okay we have to apply because it will be apart from lupus nephritis the use of mmf in for other indication will be of label use okay we have calcineurin inhibitor we have methotrexate okay which is quite good to be used in uh, patients with a lot of arthralgia or arthritis in sle okay and the commonly used uh, steroid sparing agent would be aza I'll mention about rituximab and bulimab later. So this is just to show you a few of the studies why they, they have started using or why MMF came into the picture. Again, they look at MMF in refractory SLE. Okay, they found it that um, uh, it reduced disease activity as assessed by SLIDI okay, uh, significantly with p-value of 0 0.0001. And it also decreased protein urea, hence the use of MMF in lupus nephritis. So again, similar, another study to show the use of MMF in refractory juvenile SLE. Okay, and it also showed uh, benefits in, in treatment, you know, in, in juvenile SLE. This is just um, some rough guide on how uh, the um, nephrologist manage the lup uh, lupus nephritis. Okay, Go. it depends on the uh, class. Yeah, the class uh, on renal biopsy. So I wouldn't. Go, I wouldn't go in detail. So these are. Remember, I mentioned about rituximab. Uh, it is actually off label. Okay, it's a B cell depletion therapy. Uh, not much of evidence on RCTs, mainly evidence comes from uh, case series. Recent data seems to support the, the use of combination between rituximab and belumumab. Okay, there's still ongoing trial um, and hopefully we will. There are, there are reasons behind combi combining these two drugs, but um, it's quite complicated. It involves the, um, the immunology, the immunology uh, to uh, quite detail. So it will be a different, if you have to go in, you have to, we have to have another a different session, okay? 
Embolumumab is the first biologic approved for SLE. And uh, we usually, um, we only uh, give belimumab uh, in, uh, in double strand DNA positive patient, okay? And usually mild to moderate disease, not severe lu uh, lupus nephritis or even severe NPSLE. So other things that we have to consider is prevent triggers of lupus, okay? Make sure that the vitamin D is sufficient, avoid UV light, if they smoke, I advise them to stop smoking and avoid sulfur-based antibiotics. Again, this is just uh, about uh, UV protection, okay? Uh, at least you should prescribe them SPF more than 50, right? Stop smoking, as I said, and uh, this should be ongoing process. So case one just now, going back to the case one, 26-year-old Malay woman, single, intermittent fever, three months history of loss of appetite and weight. She had joint pain. The rest, uh, to, the rest of the tests to point towards uh, infection were negative, but ESR is high. So next slide. So these were the in additional investigations, so a and more than one in 1280 speckled pattern. She had leukopenia, lymphopenia, uh, normocytic normochromic anemia, low C3, C4. So in her case, her, in her case, we actually started her with slightly just low, mild, uh, it's a mild disease. So we just give her low dose steroid and taper it down and hy just hydroxychloroquine. And she's still well now, we just hydroxychloroquine alone. This is another leg, a girl, a 23-year-old Malay woman, presented to local clinic with increasing dyspnea, intermittent fever but no loss of appetite or weight, chest x-ray right through her effusion. So she was treated as CAP with pneumonic effusion. Three weeks later, the effusion did not resolve and referred to chest. Of course, in Malaysia, we have to make sure we are not dealing with TB. She's not diabetic um, and uh, she's basically well before this. So next... So she was admitted uh, to the ward and they noted unilateral loss of eyebrow, sparse hair, but no alopecia, uh, exudative pleural effusion, TB screening negative. The rest of the tests were normal. So in the end, because of this puzzling uh, case, we actually screened for CTD. Her ANA came back as positive. She also got double-stranded DNA. We treated her with uh, steroid, effusion resolved. And she's just now on hydroxychloroquine and doing quite well. The third case, remember, this is a 52-year-old Chinese woman who has had, who has been, who has had uh, ITP for many years, 17 years. So she was well under hemato follow-up. Suddenly presented with progressive progressive dyspnea, worsening to the point that she couldn't lie flat. Uh, serocytes, pericardial effusion, bilateral pleural effusion. Okay, urinary FEME, 3 plus protein. Next. With acute uh, uh, kidney injury, okay, ACO also was poor LV function. Her ANA, uh, 1 in 1280 homogeneous pattern, positive double stranded DNA, low complement, and in her case, she had lupus nephritis class 4. So she received high dose steroid together with IV cyclophosphamide. And uh, she completed the six cycles, and she's now on maintenance uh, low dose prednisolone together with azathioprine and doing quite well. So far, no relapse. So, in summary uh, of treatment approach in SLE, firstly, you have to ensure that you assess the patient carefully to establish the diagnosis, determine likely prognosis, assess severity and organ involvement. You have to decide whether is there any major organ involvement. Hence, if, it's no, if there's no major organ involvement, maybe anti-malaria, low-dose steroid, okay, uh, ASA or methotrexate uh, would be good enough for them. Okay? So, however, if there is major organ involvement, you have to decide which part of the organ which is involved and um, what would be the best mo mo modality to treat the patient. Okay? Is it by the use of cyclophosphamide, is it MMF or cyclosporine, or whether you need to consider biologic. And don't ever forget about lifestyle changes, okay? Topical agents, symptomatic agents, 
and manage comorbidities. We can't, we always have to think about the bone health of the patient also because majority of the time, some patients may not be able to be uh, totally off the steroid, okay? And they've been on steroids so for many, many years. So we have to think about osteoporosis and uh, other complications such as atherosclerosis or premature atherosclerosis or coronary artery disease. Do, I, do we have time? So briefly about SLE and pregnancy. So we need to know other associated immunology. So you have to uh, know about, so all patients with lupus, of course, you will do all those associated immunology anyway. Okay, but particularly very important uh, in those with uh, of childbearing age, you need to know whether there is concomitant anti-SSA or anti-SSB or whether they have APLA and autoantibodies. Thyroid function is also a must. Hydroxychloroquine must be maintained. Uh, and this can also reduce the risk of complete heart block. Lowest dose possible of glucocorticoid and other drugs may be used, such as ASA, aspirin, or low molecular heparin. Should only get pregnant when disease is in remission for a minimum of six months. And we have to manage very closely together with the obstetrician. If they have NTSSA or NTSSB, uh, we need to uh, inform our obstetrician for closer echo monitoring from 16 weeks onwards. Uh, if, if a mother has APA with no previous thrombotic event, aspirin uh, suffice, but uh, in some centers, they still add on the low dose, uh, the, the um, not treatment dose, the prophylaxis dose of low liquid heparin. So, in conclusion, SLE is an autoimmune disease that can affect any part of the body. We can use the criteria if the ANA, say for example, ANA negative, you're not sure, but they have other uh, features to suggest lupus, okay? Or we can use the latest criteria that uses ANA as entry point, okay? All this you can actually download if you can't remember, because I can't remember the, the, latest, guide, uh, the latest criteria of hand. So I have to use the, 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 the website also to, to actually follow through and see the points, okay? Remember that all SLE patients should be on hydroxychloroquine and vitamin D. Avoidance of triggers such as sun exposure, smoking, sulfur drugs, and multidisciplinary approach. So SLE is the basically is the one disease that can encompasses a lot of uh, multi organs, multi system. So you might have to work with nephrologists, hematologists, respiratory physician, cardiologist, obstetrician, etc. So we work together so that we can give the, we can deliver the best care. Um, as, as I said before, I'm not really the expert in this area, but as, as we go about, as we evolve, as we learn and manage as many patients as we can, we will learn, we learn through our patients to see how best to manage the patient, um, to keep them in remission as much as we can, or in low disease activity. At the same time, they can continue their life as uh, normally, resume their work or resume their studies uh, and lessening the, the complications, either from the disease or from the drugs. I think that's all for now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Noraini, for the excellent talk. Very informative uh, overview. And also touched on the treatment approach and the pregnancy, which is very important to us. Um, are there any questions? And how do I uh, read out the questions? OK, so there is a question. Is there any? Is there, is there any criteria for, for us to admit patient? I don't think there is any standard criteria. So it, it, again, as I said, you have to assess if you have a patient in front of you, you have to assess the, the, which organs which are, uh, are affected now. Okay, so if you just have um, mild leukopenia, mild thrombocytopenia, and the um, patient is actually quite well in front of you, uh, just a bit of joint pain, I think you can manage as outpatient. But of, of course, if you have somebody who comes to you 
uh, feeling unwell with fever and uh, suddenly you see deterioration of uh, kidney function and urine FEME showed three plus with low complements and this kind of patient, of course, you have to admit the patient. So again, clinical examination of the patient is very important and assessing the all, all organs involved. Uh, second, quest second question is, can you explain more on the ANA pattern, whether it's speckled, uh, speckled and homogeneous? That is a tough question. <laughs> uh, it is just a pattern uh, that reflects whether it's uh, um, it, uh, the, 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 the nuclear pattern. Okay, so if homogeneous is more also, uh, is more for lupus, okay, points towards lupus, it doesn't mean that if it's speckled pattern, it, you can't have it in SLE. It's just in speckled pattern, uh, it's commonly associated with uh, anti-SSA, SSB also. So it will tell you, it's just a, a, the, 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 how the, the ANA, uh, the, the pattern of the, the nuclear. I don't okay. know whether I said the, the, the thing very well, unless Dr. Moliza wants to add more. Okay, so this, uh, we usually do not pay that much of attention to the uh, pattern because it depends uh, highly on the person who's reading it. So especially, uh, so homogeneous means it's something like more of a DSDNA pattern. So that's why Dr. Nora said that it's more to lupus. Speckle is the, the rest of the ENAs. So you get your anti rho your anti-SSC, and the, all those will give you a central mirror pattern or a speckled pattern that you will see. And sometimes different people reading it may come out differently. Uh, so that is, well, you can know about it, but it will not change very much just because it's a speckled pattern. Therefore, it is not a, a, a lupus. So it doesn't work that way. Uh, of interest is actually uh, looking uh, at the ANA theater. So we, we always see uh, or get referrals of ANA 1 in 80. So now perhaps you will say now that with the new criteria in 2019 that anybody is 1 in uh, 80, you will probably think of a lupus, so that is pretty dangerous. Um, but it's good to have a high index of suspicion. Uh, those kind of criteria is very good when you are doing research. Uh, so you, you will have all those clinical criteria and the ANA, ANA even though it's low, so you will uh, most likely when in a uh, 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 research, uh, the SLE will most likely be uh, clinically present. But in uh, the normal situation, if you have ANA in 1 in 80, there is multiple causes of 1 in 80, including normal situation, pregnancy, thyroid, autoimmune hepatitis, all those other diseases were also 1 in 80. So you really have to go into your clinical features uh, and see if actually uh, linked to uh, the ANA positive of lupus. So the, okay. whatever laboratory uh, test that you do must tie in with your clinical presentation yeah. and history also. So you can't run away from that. So the next question is SLE in pregnancy treatment. Is it the same as APLS? Mm. Okay, maybe I can answer that. <laughs> uh, SLE in pregnancy, SLE in APLS. So you can have uh, SLE and APLS, which is together. And so we will follow together. Or you may have APLS alone without SLE. So SLE, you will be managing just like what Dr. Noraini has said, and including uh, the antiphospholipid uh, problems, which is going to be another big lecture on how you manage with what medication. So you can have SLE with antiphospholipid, that means you treat them together with aspirin, uh, with or without uh, anticoagulation, or you may follow up an antiphospholipid syndrome primary without ASLE. I think, is that what you mean? So if, if, if we are not answering, you can re-ask the questions later. The next question is, hi doctor, just wondering what was the cause for the unilateral loss of eyebrow? If systemic, it would cause both sides, right? 
Uh, it was a puzzling case, uh, but uh, when we when we have excluded all other possible causes, so one thing about before you jump into saying that this patient has got CTD or lupus, you have to exclude other things, many other things. So when we finally exhausted ourselves and we have excluded all the, the common ones and finally we screened for ANA, somehow with a steroid, uh, her eyebrow actually improved. So I don't know, maybe it's the same as when you have alopecia, non-scaring alopecia, the, the loss of uh, increased hair loss, whether that's the reason why she's losing the eyebrow. But only why one and, and not bilateral, uh, only God knows. Okay, the next question is, is sulfur drugs contraindicated in SLE patients? It can trigger uh, flare. It's not an absolute contraindication. It can trigger it the best avoided if possible. And, okay, I think we've uh, answered this question between homogeneous and speckled. Any comment on IVIG for severe life-threatening lupus? Um, the use of IVIG um, is usually effective in you have severe, say for example, ITP, okay, more, more no, hematological. But we use, in my own practice, I tend to use IVIG if I have uh, overwhelming infection, okay, and I know I cannot pulse the patient with uh, IV metoprat. Um, just keeping at a very low dose. Remember, the, the next second, the second commonest cause of death in amongst SLE patients is infection. And um, a glucocorticoid, high dose glucocorticoid is quite notorious. Okay. Um, I've had a few elderly patients who died uh, due to fungal infection just from glucocorticoid use alone. Okay. So, hence, in, in, if I have a very ill patient with infection on board, um, only then I would be using, I would be considering IVIG. You know, act, inactive evidence of infection, yes, I might use IVIG. In some uh, centers also, in active lupus, uh, if, if amongst the pregnant mothers, um, if you're worried about using high-dose uh, metapred or high-dose uh, uh, steroid, uh, if they're acutely unwell, at, uh, sometimes we also use IVIG. Whether Dr. Dr. Melissa has got other answers too. Yeah, I agree with what Dr. Noraini said. IVIG uh, in uh, life threatening lupus flare, yeah, we actually, uh, if you look at the literature, it's usually uh, an anecdotal report and you will see that uh, it actually works. So, it, uh, so because it works, actually, it, uh, it comes out in the journal. So those uh, that we give and didn't work will not come out in the journal. So there is no uh, studies to show like whether you give or you don't give makes any difference. But uh, like Dr. Noraini said, uh, for the potential benefit and theoretical benefit of IVIG, uh, which most of the time the uh, mechanism is unknown ex except uh, apart from that, it's probably competitive by many of the uh, antibodies so that we actually give this IVIG. Uh, we usually uh, use it in, um, in patients whom we think there is a severe infection but also severe uh, lupus that we cannot immunosuppress these patients further. So like the uh, a tie over or buying time. Um, next question is what is sled eye scoring? Is that the score uh, used to guide on us on admission? This is SLE disease uh, activity index. So you score, you have points to score and see whether you will you fall into mild flare, moderate or active or no flare. Okay, you can so, use it. It's a good thing to use. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so, uh, so maybe um, don't be so um, uh, on the scoring. So hmm. maybe you, you all, uh, for those probably not in rheumatology, those in rheumatology, when they use the score, they have uh, an idea of what the score means to them. So, but I guess those who are not in rheumatology, uh, internees, medical officers, I think you better look at the clinical presentation, like Dr. Noraini said, look at what organ, what organ is involved. The organ will tell you whether you, you are worried about this patient, you need to know more about this patient. Uh, if the patient, sometimes you may have a high score, 
because you, you will look at the belimumab trial, they are actually included with high uh, SLEDI, but if you look at the actual SLEDI score, uh, or the component of the SLEDI score is on the uh, low complements, uh, positive of the double stranded, and also musculoskeletal, um, a bit on rash for the sensitivity. So that makes up the score. But that does not mean the patient has got major. So maybe you will have a bad lupus nephritis with a mild impairment. You see in your SME scoring, the renal impairment is not there. So you may have a lupus nephritis, proteinuria, and you also have renal impairment. The score is the same, correct? But you know that anybody with a bad renal impairment is very severe involvement of the kidney. Correct. So, so those are the patients you probably want to admit the patient, work up and uh, try to uh, get the treatment early so that you can reduce the nephron damage and the nephron loss because of the disease. Or you have an organ involvement, like, uh, you know, this patient may have a little bit of malar rash, a little bit of joint, but otherwise, but the patient is actually confused, you know, confused. Uh, so you might also want to admit this kind of patients. So because the treatment is actually different. So my advice is look at the organ of involvement rather than whatever scoring. Next question is any biological medication or therapy can be used for SLE patient? The only drug which is licensed for SLE is belumumab. And we use rituximab uh, on case-to-case -case basis. Um, not just any 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 biologic. So you, you have to understand that. So I think um, this is probably more important and relevant amongst the uh, rheumatoid fraternity. So in general, uh, we don't simply just dish out on map or even rituximab. Uh, I think the map when it first came out, everybody was excited because after 50 years, uh, that is the first drug that actually being um, not even cyclophosphamide, not even uh, rituximab, not even azathioprine has actually been uh, uh, licensed for lupus. So after 50 years, I think belumumab is the drug that licensed for lupus. So we had high hopes for belumumab, but unfortunately, the, the niche for the belumumab use is probably really quite narrow, I must say, in our experience. Uh, so you, if you want to use the limo map, you're probably going to look into how the trial of the limo map use uh, yeah. the limo map. Uh, yeah. Cannot be generalized, I think. Next question is, how do we use sleep criteria or late, do we use sleep criteria or latest ACR criteria to diagnose SLB? Um. Okay, it's a classification criteria. So one is you, you one must understand that to diagnose, yes, you can use slick, uh, but um, you can use either one. But the problem comes when you have remember there's less than five percent of patients with lupus will be A and A negative. So when you have A and A negative patient, but the presentation seems to look like uh, lupus, then. Uh, in my own personal experience, I'll probably use the slick more than the because the other the other criteria uh, you have to have ANA positive as the entry ent, uh, entrant criteria. Uh, that's how I look at it, and still you can't run away from looking at the clinical presentation. So look at the clinical presentation. Make sure you exclude the common things because uh, SLE can be a, a mimicker of many things. You have to remember that. Okay, so reassess everything way uh, in and out and then you have to look at the clinical and immunology from there you can decide uh, which one so if you have ANA which is negative we had I, I from my experience one case where a young girl presented with um, so, uh, serocytis very severe pleural effusion bilateral and pericardial, uh, pericardial effusion uh, so much so we worked up we worked her up uh, everything were negative, including TB. So in the end, I think uh, Datuk Wahi is here. So he, uh, through through that case, we decided since nobody wanted to own her, to own to to uh, wanted to have ownership of the care. So in the end, thrown to rheumatology as usual. Um, then we gave IV, uh, we gave steroid, and then uh, she got better. Okay, after excluding malignancy, after excluding TB, and she got better. And two years later. 
uh, she had other symptoms, other clinical manifestation, and we rescreened, and the antibodies became positive now, uh, now. I mean, two years after. So the initial screening was negative. Uh, we've excluded everything, and, and hence, because the, 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 the problem is still there, we needed some form of uh, management, okay? And uh, we treated as such that it's a steroid responsive disease. Uh, follow, follow the patient up and eventually she developed more symptoms and, and it can, because that's why I said it can change. So as long as you follow the patient up and you have excluded the, the, the you know, like effusion, all those things, you have to make sure you are not missing a malignancy or a TB in Malaysia then uh, it's not wrong to actually treat, but you must follow the patient up and weigh everything. Yeah, I agree with Noraini. And uh, I, I think the message, uh, take home message is that uh, if the ANA is actually negative, please look for other causes like what they actually do. They look hard for all the possible causes to explain that condition and then uh, treat accordingly and follow up the patient closely. In those days, uh, we do not have ANA HEP2 cells. So previously, long time ago, we were using murine cells uh, for the ANA test and the sensitivity is actually quite low. It's actually about 80%. But I think now most labs are using the HEP2 cells. The HEP2 cells are actually quite uh, sensitive. So it will take up about mm, more than 95% positivity. The other thing is, uh, if the patient has got multi-organ involvement and your ANA is actually negative, be really hard, be hard in looking at other diseases, other multi-system diseases before blaming it on uh, that is actually a lupus. So sometimes we are so comfortable uh, giving steroids and we make that diagnosis. Uh, if it's in another autoimmune, it's not a problem. But if it's an infection which is undiagnosed, which is uh, chronic and will manifest when you put the patients on steroids, then it's a bit too late to actually uh, turn back. So that is the only worry when the ANA is actually negative. I think uh, we have no more questions. Uh, any last word from, uh, from you, Noraini? No, I think um, I hope that uh, the 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 inf the message is through the slides are, are quite clear for everybody. Um, as I said, SLE is elusive and it uh, is a is a great mimicker. So please, not everybody jump in, uh, not to um, not to jump into the diagnosis for SLE uh, immediately when you see um, you see any ill patient. But of course, in younger in young patients. Uh, in young patients, you have to think uh, along the line if they present in multi-system uh, way and, um, and assess clinic, as I said, assess, uh, take a good history, uh, cl good clinical examination and assess thoroughly and weigh uh, from your clinical findings and, your, and the clinical findings that should direct you in terms of what tests you want to do. And then you can refer to the rheumatologist if you you can always ask the rheumatologist for for opinion and i would like to thank uh, dr molly for giving extra information on my behalf <laughs> okay thank you dr noraini uh, for an excellent le lecture and uh, an overview of uh, sle would like to thank uh, uh, all the participants who have uh, stayed on to listen to this uh, topic and actively uh, inquired for further information. So we have rheumatologists in every state and we're working hard to uh, expand to other satellite hospitals in that particular state. So feel free to actually get a consult from a rheumatologist uh, wherever you are. If you have an urgent case, uh, please give them a call so that they can actually uh, make uh, an earlier appointment to the particular patient. Do not just write a simple letter in the hope that the rheumatologist will give you uh, a, 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 a near appointment. 
so sometimes it depends on how you write. Uh, the judge may not find that it is urgent. So if you have an urgent case, give uh, one of us a ring. So with that, thank you to everyone and Academy of Medicine. So I will pass back to Dr. Jivan. Hi, uh, Dr. Muliza. Thanks for a great session for this evening session, Dr. Muliza and also Dr. Noraini. So now Academy of Medicine will be sharing our QR code for today. So we'll meet again next week for our last week of uh, Rumoto month. And uh, what do you call our topic will be a uh, CTD with uh, ILD. So... So that's all for today. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank, Thank you. you Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Molly. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Even how to scan the QR code on my phone. Nah. Dr. Wahi, I think you need to print screen this and then send it to your email and then uh -huh. uh, open up the email with your laptop and then use your handphone, the MMA app to screen it. <laughs> Okay, okay. A lot of steps. <laughs> That's why. <right. laughs> I got two phones, okay. La. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Noraini, um, is it okay for us to share the this recording? Because I, I see that your slides have some of the patient's information. Sorry, I unmute myself. Uh, the three cases, uh, I didn't reveal the identity of the patient. So it should be okay, right? <clears throat> yeah, it should be okay. Because okay. even the, the, the photos also, we already, um, in the other, the other two photos were it's taken better. from the, Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Noraini. Okay, thanks, thanks. <laughs>